Bienvenidos a la segunda charla de, de esta sesión de la mañana, del segundo día del workshop. Esta vez tenemos eh, a Arabas Meyan, el hermano mayor que tengo, eh, un, uno de los más eh, de, de la comunidad, que, nos, eh, que es de la, del Graduate Center en CUNY, en Nueva York, ¿ya? Eh, y que nos va a hablar sobre superficies de Riemann homogéneas. Ara, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ruben. And uh, I apologize for not being able to speak Spanish. You wouldn't want me to speak Spanish, try to speak Spanish anyway. Um, Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. This is great. Um, you know, we, we've all been locked up and uh, for a while, and um, it's nice to, uh, to connect with old friends and, um, and new ones. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, in the near future, we'll be able to do something in person, both um, us coming down there to Chile, and maybe uh, we have uh, some events over here in New York and and get uh, some of you here. Okay, I wanna, uh, so I'm going to tell you about, uh, the idea is to talk about quasi-conformally homogeneous Riemann surfaces. So there's a lot of words there. So I'm going to try to uh, slowly go through the ideas, but I want you to sort of uh, step back for a moment and uh, take, Let's just, what does the concept of homogeneous mean? Often when you say something is homogeneous, you sort of mean no matter where you are in that space, um, <clears throat> it looks the same, okay? But it depends on what category we're talking about. So, you know, in general, and here's a silly sort of definition because we're gonna quickly leave this definition and go directly to what I'm really, what we're really interested in, but, Uh, but it's good to sort of get um, a, a broad um, sort of concept first. And by the way, the new things I'm going to talk about are all joint work with Nick Blamis. So uh, if we have a Riemann surface, okay, uh, and you have a group of self-homeomorphisms of X, uh, doesn't matter what kind of group it is. It could have more structure, it could have, uh, uh, it could have just the homeomorphisms. Uh, we're going to say that the, the surface X is G homogeneous if for any two points there's an element of the group that maps that one point to the other point. Okay, so that's what this, um, this business is. Uh, for any two points, there's an element of the group that maps the one point to the other. So, um, For example, if G was just the full group of homeomorphisms of the Riemann surface, there are obvious um, maps that will take any point to any other point. In fact, um, you know, given any point, any two points, you could draw a little neighborhood sort of like that, uh, which is simply connected and uh, find a homeomorphism of the surface that um, is the identity on the boundary of the uh, uh, outside. Uh, it's, it's the identity on the outside of this thing. And it maps uh, this point to this point. And you could do that with a diffeomorphism too. Um, on the other hand, if I said, uh, if the group we started with was a discrete group of homeomorphisms, then obviously you can't, Uh, the action is not, uh, the word is uh, homogeneous or transitive, there are going to be points that are not equivalent on the surface. So, um, so this is a concept, right? And depends on the group and depends on the category or structure we're looking at. So let me back off a moment and just remind you of what a Riemann surface is. So there's lots of different points of view of Riemann surfaces. There's the complex analytic point of view of the Riemann surface. There's the hyperbolic geometric viewpoint. There's an algebraic geometric viewpoint of uh, what a Riemann surface is. I'm going to focus on the <clears throat> complex analytic and the hyperbolic today. Uh, so um, the complex analysis definition of Riemann surface is that you have a complex structure on the surface. So what does that mean? That means that for you have some um, um, atlas of charts 
And for any two charts that overlap, the transition function is a conformal map. Okay, so that means that given any point, there's an, and given any two uh, charts um, containing that point, uh, there's this coordinate map to the complex plane, this other coordinate map to the complex plane. And then if you go like this, that's a map from the complex plane to the complex plane. And we're requiring that those transition maps be conformal, okay? If we were just talking about a smooth structure, then the transition maps would be diffeomorphisms uh, and so on. You could talk about C1 maps, uh, C1 structures. You could talk about real analytic structures. Um, we could talk about hyperbolic structure where the transition map then uh, would be restrictions of isometries of the hyperbolic plane, okay? So that's the concept of a Riemann surface that the transition functions are conformal. So you have this com complex structure. Um, let me just say equivalently, you could view the Riemann surface as a hyperbolic surface. And what does that mean? Well, like I said up here, you could take as the definition that the transition maps are now restrictions of isometries of the hyperbolic plane. But an alternate way of viewing this is that it's the hyperbolic plane mod a discrete group of isometries. Okay, and what's the hyperbolic plane? Well, here's a model for the hyperbolic plane. By the way, please uh, stop me if something doesn't make sense. I know uh, it's not easy and sometimes I might not see what's in the chat. Um, so if uh, somebody just alerts me that there's a question. I'll, I'll, sir, I'm per I have no agenda. I can deviate in any direction you want me to deviate in. So please don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, so here's the hyperbolic plane, a uh, um, uh, model for the hyperbolic plane. It's the unit disk model. And here's a, the line element. Okay. And this basically tells you anything, everything. This is a Ramanian surface. Um, uh, this tells you how to measure lengths of curves. Um, angles are the same as angles in the Euclidean uh, plane in this embedding. Um, you can measure areas uh, and so on. The geodesics in this geometry are arcs of circles perpendicular to the boundary or diameters. <clears throat> okay. So I told you what a um, Riemann surfaces. Now I should, um, what I'm really after are, um, we, I mentioned to you what it should mean to be a G homo homogeneous surface. So the focus of this talk is about the G being a, a group of quasi-conformal mappings, okay? So let me, let me first, before I say anything that's written down here, um, when you have a conformal mapping, uh, infinitesimally what that does is that what it, what it means is that circles get mapped to circles, okay? So in the tangent plane, if you take a circle, it gets mapped to another circle. Um, the derivative of the conformal map maps that circle to a circle. Now, if you relax the conformal condition and say it's just a diffeomorphism, for instance, then what happens is uh, infinitesimally, a circle in the tangent plane gets mapped to an ellipse, such as this. Here's a circle, I'm thinking of this in the, in the tangent plane now of the surface, and a circle gets mapped to an ellipse. That's what the derivative does of a, a diffeomorphism. And there's some distortion, of course, because it's an ellipse. And the ellipse has, the distortion is what's called the eccentricity, there's sort of a maximal uh, uh, axis and a minimal axis. And um, this is at the point X got mapped to F of X and you have this tangent space here at F of X and um, you have this ellipse in the tangent space and the eccentricity of the ellipse is the ratio of the maximal um, uh, axis to the minimal, maximal length of the axis to the minimal length. 
Uh, so it's capital MX divided by little mx. So that happens at every point whenever you have a diffeomorphism. But if it's just a diffeomorphism, that distortion can change radically as the point X moves around in your space. For example, if you look at the diffeomorphism that, um, let me just draw you a picture here. If you look at the di diffeomorphism, maybe I'll go over here. If you look at the diffeomorphism that takes uh, the unit ball, or sorry, unit disc to the complex plane, right? Uh, there's a radial map that does that. This right here gets mapped to this whole ray. That's a diffeomorphism between the unit disc and the complex plane. Um, and you can look at the distortion of infinitesimal circles over here inside the unit disc. And what happens is as you move closer and closer to the boundary here of the unit disc, the diffeomorphism necessarily distorts the circle more and more. The eccentricity uh, goes off to infinity, okay? These, these little infinitesimal circles here are getting mapped to very, very long um, ellipses, long in one direction. And so in the end, the eccentricity is unbounded for this diffeomorphism. So what's the definition of a quasi-conformal map? Well, you're gonna be K, so there's a K involved. You're K quasi-conformal if the distortion, no matter what point you're sitting on, is uniformly bounded by K. Okay, so no matter where you look, that circle gets distorted at most a certain amount, that certain amount is K. Okay, so formally speaking, you have, a, a, if F is a homeomorphism, orientation preserve, everything inside is orient, orientation preserving, by the way. I, I don't usually say it, but everything inside is orientation preserving. So F is a orientation preserving homeomorphism, and we say that it's, K quasi-conformal, if there's a K bigger than or equal to one, in which the eccentricity is always bounded by uh, K. It's always bounded from below by one, but it's bounded from above by K, no matter what point you look at in the Riemann surface. So this is clearly sort of a conformal or complex analytic um, uh, concept. The, concept of distortion being bounded at the infinitesimal level of a circle. Now, if the map is, a, is actually a conformal mapping, then the K is one. I should have written that down right here. <laughs> oh, here it is. One quasi-conformal maps are conformal maps because that means that circles go to circles. Infinitesimal circles go to infinitesimal circles and that's what it means to be a conformal map for a homeomorphism to be a conformal map, okay? Or, or in other words, a biholomorphic mapping. So, so there's this notion of quasi-conformal. Now, why, why, let me back off a moment and why is this interesting or could be interesting? Um, this goes back to, uh, you know, I, if you go back to the, uh, the classical complex analysts, they started to realize that quasi conformal maps play, and Teichmuller realized this, um, and, and hence the name Teichmuller space. Uh, the notion of two complex structures on a surface being close is captured by the notion of a quasi conformal map, okay? This limited distortion. So the notion of a quasi-conformal map ar arises in the study of Riemann surfaces, namely Teichmuller spaces and moduli spaces. It also arises in um, extremal problems in complex analysis, classical extremal problems. And it plays the role, quasi-conformal maps have some, conformal maps are pretty rigid, so it's hard to work with them often to use them as a tool, quasi-conformal maps sort of have the right 
or the right generalization of conformal maps to be used as a tool uh, for solving, uh, for working on um, complex analytic problems. They're a very important tool in studying complex dynamics, for instance, as well as Riemann surfaces. So um, let me just give you a little bit of, that, of uh, properties of quasi-conformal mappings. Uh, if F is K, so I, I say that F is KQC, meaning it's uh, quasi-conformal with the constant K. Uh, if I just say it's a quasi-conformal map, that means there is a K in which it's KQC, okay? And if F is KQC, F inverse is always guaranteed to be KQC. And the reason is because if F looked like this, if F was such a map where at X it was distortion, uh, distorting this much in the maximal stretch direction and this much in the minimal stretch direction, then the inverse map is going to do, well, what you think it should do. Um, it'll take a point and then, um, so actually this should be F of X here. <laughs> and this is the, uh, the pre-image X. This is, uh, so what do you do to that? What do you, so ask yourself the question, what do I have to do to this ellipse to go back to a circle? Well, <laughs> uh, you have to contract this by one over MX, right? Which is what's going on here. And then you have to contract or expand this by, whoops. Um, you have to expand this by um, one over MX. So, so that's what this mapping is. It takes the circle, infinitesimal circle here to um, the long axis is now one over little mx and the short axis is one over capital mx. And if you take the eccentricity of this thing, well, the eccentricity of that thing is uh, what? The long axis is, so it's always the long axis divided by the shorter axis. And that's exactly mx over little mx, which was the best, and that was bounded by k. So f inverse also has the same um, quasi conformal constant. Okay, so, so that's good. Um, this I mentioned before that one QC maps are conformal maps. Questions so far before I go on? No question in the chat, at least. Thank you. Properties, some more properties, some more interesting properties. So, so uh, you know, if you've heard me talk before, I'm always very, um, I'm very interested in the relationship between complex analytic objects and hyperbolic geometric objects. And how do you go back and forth? The, the relationship is transcendental in general. So, anything you can say is sometimes interesting. So uh, one of the properties is a property in the large about um, QC maps. And so here's how it goes. So suppose F is a, a mapping between two Riemann surfaces, that's KQC, okay? Then it turns out to be a quasi-isometry. And let me explain what that means. So this is a quasi-isometry with respect to with respect to the hyperbolic metric. So the idea of a quasi-isometry is that it's by Lipschitz in the large. That's the idea. And these constants are the constants. The K is the by Lipschitz constant. And then this is some added additive constant because it's only in the large. So what this really Formally speaking, the definition is, so this D is the distance, hyperbolic distance between two points, and it's bounded by K times the distance between the points. If I just wrote this, it would be the Lipschitz condition, but I'm gonna add an additive constant here that depends on K. And then use a, similarly a lower bound, one over K.
So that's that's a quasi isometry. One that satisfies <clears throat> uh, this relation. So the additive constant basically says that you don't know what's happening locally in a, in a small little neighborhood. And it's controlled in that it's only in these size neighborhoods. But outside that, if you go in the large, you're really a bi Lipschitz map. Okay. So QC maps are always quasi isometries. Okay, so this is useful because it says something about distortion of distances. Okay, so that's in the large. In the small, there's a little lemma here. Um, and by the way, I'm not proving either one of these. These are properties that actually these properties come out of uh, classical complex analysis results. Um, so, so this is the first property in the large. In the small, here's what happens. Suppose you have, and I'm just gonna do this in the hyperbolic plane, but it's also true on any hyperbolic surface. If you have a KQC map, then the distance between the points, again, the hyperbolic distance this is, between uh, the image points is bounded from below by a function of the distance between X and Y. The function's a bit complicated to look at. Um, it depends on K and that's it, okay? But the important thing to realize about this function is that um, it's an increasing function um, and also the other way it goes to zero as R goes to zero. It's a function of, if you think of it as a function of R. So for example, how can this be useful? Well, if the distance, if this image distance is very small, right? Then this has, this, the original distance has to be small. Or, you know, another way of putting it is, if this distance is large, then the image distance has to be, um, in fact, even larger. So there's a little overlap with this condition, but not completely, because this also applies to uh, what's happening in the small. Whereas this doesn't say anything, quasi-isometry doesn't say anything about what's happening in the small. That's why I wrote here in the small. Okay, so we have two geometric properties of KQC maps, um, two geometric properties, hyperbolic geometric properties, which we'll use. So if we, so let me just use it right now, this lemma. Sorry, there's a delay time in the way this goes up and down. Okay, <laughs> I should wait, right. <laughs> This is my connection problem, I guess, because it's Bluetooth going from the iPad to the laptop. Um, so how could you use this property to say something about, uh, so here's, so I want to think about now, suppose we have this Riemann surface and what does it mean that there's a, KQC map that takes a point X to a point Y. What kind of conditions are there about the geometry around X um, uh, and the geometry about the, the image? So so let me tell you something about um, injectivity radius. So I'm starting, we're starting with X, a Riemann surface, okay? So I'm thinking of it as a hyperbolic surface. Okay, here it is. It's got genus three, this one. And I look, look at a point X, find the largest disc that's embedded. This has a hyperbolic metric, so it's a hyperbolic surface. So I can look for the largest disc centered at X. That's the injectivity radius at X. That's the injectivity radius centered at X. 
And now, if f was a KQC map, then uh, of the same Riemann surface, so f goes from x to x, f goes from x to x. Um, the image of this point is f of x, right? The image of this ball, while well, it's a KQC map, it's going to get distorted into something, okay? But I can ask for what's the size of the injectivity radius at f of x, okay? What's the largest ball I can embed over here? This is in the same Riemann surface and x got mapped to f of x. Well, that previous result can be used to prove this. The injectivity radius here has to be at least as big as capital F of the injectivity radius here. Capital L, sorry, capital F sub K. Depends on K. Um, so why is that? Well, you can think of it like this. The injectivity radius, that's the largest ball that's embedded largest disk that's embedded at uh, and centered at X. That's another way of saying that is if you look up in the universal cover, you can find two lifts of X up in the universal cover. Um, and there, if you take the ball of radius, injectivity radius, they're gonna bump those balls. And so you can measure this distance between these lifts. And if you measure that distance and then look at the image distance in the hyperbolic plane, so I took two lifts, I take the image distance. So this was like X tilde, X1 tilde and X2 tilde. This is F of X1 tilde. This is F of X2 tilde. This distance is related to this distance. At least there's a bound because of this inequality here. Here, this is x1 tilde, this is x2 tilde. Uh, sorry, this is f of x1 tilde, this is f of x2 tilde, this is x1 tilde, this is x2 tilde. So an application of this result says something about the injectivity radius, that the injectivity radius of the image point is bounded from below by this function of the injectivity radius of x. So um, let me back up a moment. <clears throat> so for example, if the Riemann surface had a cusp, if this were X, Well, the injectivity radius of this object, of this surface, goes to zero as you move out the cusp. Okay, there's shorter and shorter geodesic loops here. So the injectivity radius is going to zero. So if I asked for a KQC map that took this point X to say some point way out here, the answer is they can't be one. Because if there was one that took this point to this point, well, the injectivity radius here is whatever it is, it's some number, right? So, um, but the injectivity radius in the image would be very, very small, which would mean this number is small. And then this number um, is constant, it's just some, some number, because I've just fixed X. And so if I go far enough out, this will get too small and the inequality is violated. So there is no KQC map. Um, if I have a cusp and I ask for points over here that are mapped very far out the cusp, okay? This is a key point because when I get to the concept of being quasi-conformally homogeneous, such objects, such surfaces can't be quasi-conformally homogeneous. I haven't told you what that means yet, but... <clears throat> Okay, so cusps are bad, okay. Um, what's another thing that's bad? 
in this context while we're at it is uh, you might have a hyperbolic surface that has a funnel. Okay, so this is a, a funnel. It's, it's opening up exponentially fast as you move out in a geometric way. Um, so now if I, uh, in a similar, similar way, uh, let's see, if I take some point here and I take a point very, very far out here. So the point is when I'm very far out here, the injectivity radius is very, very large when you're way out here. It goes off to infinity as you go this way. Because when you look at this, for instance, there's, there's, there's a half plane embedded in here. So a half plane, uh, like a, uh, literally like a half plane in the hyperbolic plane. So the further out you go in the hyperbolic plane toward the boundary, you have larger and larger injectivity. So you can, um, you could embed something, a ball inside this half plane as large as you want as you go further and further toward the boundary. So the injectivity radius goes to infinity as I move this way. So if I asked for a KQC map that took say a point way out here to this point here, um, which way do I want this to go? Um, yeah, if I wanted it to go uh, from a point way out here, which has large injectivity radius to something that has a fixed injectivity radius, that can't happen again. That would violate this because um, this would be large here because this would be large, yet this is fixed. So again, the conclusion is conclusion is um, if we want, if, uh, again, I haven't told you what a quasi-chromally homogeneous surface is, but if we want something that's homogeneous with respect to KQC maps, you can't have cusps and you can't have funnels. So no cusps, whoops. if we want uh, KQC maps um, acting, I'll say the word, homogeneously. Okay, so that's the take home from, from that. Okay, so I said the word, now I'm gonna define. <laughs> Um, where we are. Are there any questions? Oh, is there something in the chat? Yeah, but it's not for a question. No problem. Oh, it's not a question. It's a comment. Okay. Yeah. I like hey, the, I like the Ara, comment. Ara, why you didn't say that the group of K quasi conformal homomorphisms is acting transitively instead to use homogeneous? Yeah, it, it's it's a matter of choice of words. You're, you're right. You could say transitive. Yeah. You know, in the literature, if you go back, um, you know, the notion of a homogeneous, um, homo homogeneous Ramanian manifold. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's that, and often that means acting transitively. <laughs> yeah, but also in the at. tangent. Yes. So that means homogeneous, not only transitively, yeah, so, but also transitively in the tangent at the level of the tangent. Yeah, that's right. So, so in differential geometry, when they say homogeneous, they mean there's a there's a, a transitive action that maps um, uh, vectors to their negatives. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, transitive would have been just as good too. Okay. I, I like the word homogeneous. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. 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 I like transit. I, I like, yeah, I like both, actually. Right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what's a Riemann surface? 
uh, which is K uh, uh, quasi conformally homogeneous. So here's here's what I want to say. So a Riemann surface is going to be K quasi conformally homogeneous, or sometimes just said to be K QCH, or just sometimes QCH. If for any two points, there's a K QC map of the Riemann surface to itself that maps the one point to the other. Okay. So this is that notion of homogeneous. Every point looks the same from the KQC point of view, okay? So we'll say that X is QCH if there's some K in which um, uh, X is KQCH, okay? So that, those remarks that were earlier, the geometric remarks say that KQCH Riemann surfaces cannot have cusps and cannot have funnels. Okay, for injectivity radius reasons. So some quick history, the notion of QCH um, uh, was introduced by Gehring and Polka. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so this is going back in the, in the complex, uh, complex analysis domain. Um, and then Bonford Taylor, Canary and Taylor along with various co-authors investigated in a series of papers um, how the QCH relates to the hyperbolic structure. They were the, they were the first to sort of realize that, you know, to, uh, um, uh, to really analyze the relationship between the complex structure uh, when it's QCH and the hyperbolic structure. And they looked at both in dimension two and higher. Um, it turns out, I'm not gonna say anything more about this, but just, just to give you a little history, in dimension bigger than uh, two, so dimension bigger than root to three, the hyperbolic manifold is QCH is equivalent to being a regular cover of a closed um, hyperbolic orbifold, okay? So that's a theorem of theirs, and it depends heavily on rigidity. So that's where our questions start to come in is, What's the relationship between the Riemann surface being QCH and it being a, uh, whether it is a regular cover of a closed surface or not, okay? So some examples, simple examples. In dimension two, so now I'm just gonna, the rest of this discussion, we're just about dimension two here anyway. Um, if you look at the unit disk, the complex plane, the Riemann sphere, or the punctured plane, these are all one QCH Riemann surfaces. Why? Because the group of conformal maps here, uh, um, there's that word, we then transitively, <laughs> uh, act transitively here. Those are the isometries of the hyperbolic plane, the same as the isometries. And here, the group of conformal maps X transitively also. And similarly here, this is the Mobius transformations. And then similarly here, um, given any two points, you could always rotate and then uh, dilate to get, uh, and those are conformal maps, to move any point to any other point. And those are all one conformal map. So the, the, uh, these are the Riemann surfaces that are one QCH. <clears throat> Um, let me say that a closed surface if you have a closed surface a closed Riemann surface um, And you look at the group of uh, diffeomorphisms on here. Well, let me back up a moment. Um, so if you if you look at um, the closed Riemann surfaces, they're all QCH for some k. Okay, it's a compactness argument. 
So they're all QCH. Um, here's a couple of, uh, so this is, this is what I was saying earlier, so I'm just gonna repeat it. A QCH surface cannot have cusps. Uh, a QCH surface cannot have an embedded hyperbolic half plane. So that in particular means there are no funnels for your QCH Riemann surface. If the surface is infinite type, in other words, topologically infinite type, could be a Loch Ness monster, or could be a Cantor set of, uh, of ends, um, then the structure must be complete. In other words, the Fuchsian group that represents it cannot be of the second kind because you can't have these hyperbolic planes that are sitting in there, these half planes sitting in there like this because the injectivity radius goes off to infinity there and that would violate being QCH. So we're really cutting down on the number of um, structures that can be QCH. Um, Uh, the Margulis lemma, uh, let me just tell you what the Margulis lemma says. It says that, uh, so this is just sort of now, now in some sense a classical result in um, hyperbolic geometry. There's a constant so that um, if you have a hyperbolic surface that su has sufficient topology, so pi one's not infinite cyclic, then you always have an embedded disk of radius that constant, okay? no matter what hyperbolic surface it is. Um, so if you uh, combine this Margulis lemma with the proposition on injectivity radius, since you have always an embedded disk of radius D, and now since um, think of the embedded disk of radius D, it's centered at this point X. Now, if you have a QCH surface, then you have to be able to map X to any other point of the surface which means that that disk um, uh, forces some condition on the injectivity radius. And this is the condition. If X is KQC, um, and if you take a point where the injectivity radius is um, bigger than this Margulis constant, and you take some other point in the surface, uh, and you know that there has to be a KQC map that takes this point to this point, then the proposition, the earlier proposition about injectivity radius says that the injectivity radius of this image point has to be bigger than that uh, function capital F of the injectivity radius you started with. But the injectivity radius you started with was, um, had uh, injectivity radius uh, was bigger than D. So, and this is an increasing function. So FK of this is FK of this D. And this is true for all points in the surface. So the upshot is there's a lower bound on injectivity radius that depends on, only on the Margulis constant and K. So if you have a K quasi-conformally homogeneous Riemann surface, there's a lower bound on the injectivity radius. So here's where our interest started. Uh, to what extent does a QCH uh, hyperbolic surface arise as the regular cover of a closed surface? Okay, so what, what does that mean? So, um, so this I already noted a little earlier. Uh, a closed hyperbolic surface is a QCH surface. So that certainly arises as a regular cover because it's, it's itself. Um, here's an example of a regular cover of a closed hyperbolic surface. Um, so here's the closed hyperbolic surface and I've cut open along this um, simple closed non-separating curve. And then you get this Z action. This is called the ladder surface, by the way. You get the Z action by isometries. Okay, so there's a, what does it mean to be a regular cover? It means you have a properly discontinuous uh, co-compact action. 
on the surface. So here it's a Z action by isometries. And why is this regular cover um, of the closed hyperbolic surface QCH? Because now if I wanna take any point to any other point, well, it's enough to, um, I can move that other point back here by a one quasi-conformal mapping, right? Because that's the Z action by isometry. So I can move that point back into this compact set. And in this compact set, then move it um, to whatever that other point was that I needed to get to in the compact set. But see, this is a compact set, right? So there's a bound on the K that I need inside the compact set. So given any two points in here, there is a K quasi-conformal mapping um, if K is sufficiently large that maps the one point to the other. And once I have that, then I can get to any other point by just the isometry, which is one conformal. So the composition is just K quasi-conformal. So whenever you have, so the upshot is whenever you have a regular cover of a closed hyperbolic surface, it's always QCH. And our question is, what about the other way? If you have a QCA Tremont surface, is it always the regular cover of a closed hyperbolic surface? Okay, so, well, if you take the same picture, you can always change the QCH Riemann surface, the Riemann surface structure here by a quasi conformal mapping, just distort it a little bit. Well, if you do that, then it's no longer a um, geometric regular cover anymore, but it still is QCH because if I take the QCH, uh, you know, if I distort the structure by a quasi conformal mapping, I'm only distorting by a bounded amount. So you don't really change anything. So that's what the content of node three is. QC deformations of QCH Riemann surfaces is QCH, okay? So it's true that that, that shows that not in dimension two, not all QCH surfaces are regular covers, okay? But that's a silly reason, right? That's sort of a silly reason I can distort it a little by quasi conformal map. Here's a, uh, here's a more cogent reason. Uh, QCH infinite type Riemann surfaces, which are not QC deformation. So, so there exist QCH infinite type Riemann surfaces, which are not QC deformations of a regular color. Okay, this was in this paper of these authors. Um, so, um, So you can't, uh, so, so there are, we, you could consider these exotic QCH structures, QCH Riemann surfaces. They don't come from uh, QC deformations of a, um, of a Riemann surface that covers, regularly covers a closed surface. So our theorem with uh, Lamis, there's actually two theorems, but I'm only mentioning one here is this, even though, so these examples here were about um, being QC deformations. If you relax that and just ask, what are the topological regular covers of a QCH Riemann surface? We have this theorem. So let me just talk this, talk this through. Uh, so if you have a QCH Riemann surface, then it has to be the topological regular cover of a closed surface. Okay, that's the theorem. <clears throat> and in particular, um, the topological regular cover of closed surfaces are known, they're these. So in particular, a QCH surface is homeomorphic to either one of these objects. So either it's a closed surface, okay, we know that, or it's the complex plane, or it's the punctured plane, 
or it's a cantor tree surface. And I'll, I'll, I'll draw these, these are infinite type surfaces, cantor tree surface, or it's a blooming cantor tree surface, or it's the Loch Ness monster, or it's a ladder surface. And that's it. And I'll draw pictures on what these are in a moment. Actually, I'll do that right now. <clears throat> are there any questions about the statement? In the chat, at least. It's okay. Okay. So, what are these objects? So, a closed surface is definitely um, QCH. We said that already. Complex plane is definitely Q, uh, QCH. Um, punctured plane, we know. Uh, okay. What's the Cantor tree of surfaces? So, topologically, that's you could think of it like this. You have these pairs of pants and you keep growing. Same in this direction. Same here. So the number of ends, which is sort of uh, a, a way of encoding um, the number of escape routes to infinity, if you like, is a Cantor set. So this is a Cantor tree surface. So that's what this is. The blooming Cantor tree is, it's the same object, except now add, uh, tori. So just add, add here. Uh, in each one of these pairs of pants, add a little handle. So now you have an infinite genus surface and so on. <clears throat> so that's the blooming canter tree. I like that name. Uh, the Loch Ness monster surface is a um, topological description of that is many ways of thinking of it. Many, many ways of drawing it, but uh, actually let me draw it so that it's suggested that it's the Loch Ness monster. This has got one end um, and uh, it's got infinite genus and one end. It's the unique surface with infinite genus and one end. So that's the uh, Loch Ness. And then um, what was the last surface? The ladder surface. And the ladder surface is just this surface. go off in both directions. Uh, so it's it's the unique surface of um, infinite genus with two ends where both ends uh, have genus accumulated. So to appreciate this statement, by the way, um, lest you think um, there's no content here, uh, the content is if you just ask for a topological classification of all the infinite type surfaces. Okay, a topological classification. There's uncountably many of them. There's uncountably many infinite type surfaces up to topology. And yet what we're saying here is that if you put this restriction that the, QC, the Riemann surface is QCH, then in fact, there's a very limited number of them that it could be. Here's the remark. There's a
and you can construct the Riemann surface structure uh, for this. If you like, just do it so that you could do a pan stick composition where all these lengths are the same, no twist, same this way, same this way. The theorem, the theorem says that there's no KQ, uh, there's no uh, uh, Riemann surface structure on here, which is QCH. There's no way you'll be able to do it. And the idea, and this is giving you, so I'm gonna just give you the idea of the proof and then I'll, Parece que se nos cortó ahora. Sí, no era yo. Sí, sí, yo. No, no era yo. No, ah, ahí está. Connection was back. down. Your iPad is... But, but you're, you're muted. No, oh, you're mute. Was that me or you? <laughs> you. It, it no, looked like that all it. of us. Well, it, everyone. It is a possibility, but... <laughs> okay, let me, let me just... Uh, sorry. Uh, let's just finished with this. You see that? Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, Probably. so I'm just, just trying to um, show you why this, this guy cannot be a QCH Riemann surface. Put any Riemann surface structure you want on here. Uh, claim is it's not QCH. And the reason is because if it's if it was supposed to be QCH, you would be able to take any point over here, say, to any point very far away. But if you look at, say, this subsurface, this is what's called a non-displaceable subsurface. This is what happens when you don't have a regular cover um, over a closed surface. Since you don't have a regular cover, there's no way to map this piece out thing out here. What will happen is that any homeomorphism of this surface has to take this piece and it'll intersect it. So if I did have a QCH structure, that would mean that this piece would have to get stretched way out. And this has a finite, this has a fixed diameter, this piece. And if I stretch it way out and it has to come back here, it's going to have very, very long diameter. Diameter gets distorted a tremendous amount. But that violates being a quasi-isometry because to be a quasi-isometry, you're basically distorting diameters a bounded amount. That's a consequence of being a quasi-isometry. So that would violate that. And, and therefore there is no QCH surface on this um, surface that is not a regular cover. That's the idea of the proof of this theorem with Nick. And then just to close, let me just say, um, this is a, a topological classification of QCH surface. And then the next, the, the other theorem we have is that if you ask um, for the ladder surface, what the QCH structures are on the ladder surface, we do show on the ladder surface, all the QCH structures come from the regular cover and distorting it by a quasi-conformal map. So there are no exotic QCH structures on a ladder surface. Thank you, gracias. Thank you, Ara. Si hay alguna pregunta, pueden prender sus micrófonos y preguntar. No. So Ara, here's a question. So you, you fix, for example, in the Lognet monster, 
the let's say this topological surface, and then you look at all these uh, Riemann surface structures, mm -hmm. so the space of Riemann surface structure in the Lachlan master, and then you begin to stratify in the following sense. We know that the, 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 these are not one quasi conformal homogeneous, okay? Now we ask uh, some of them could be two quasi conformal right. homogeneous. And then we go to another stratification, three quasi conformal. So one can try to stratify this Riemann subtraction in terms of this K. Right. How this looks like in the space of a Riemann surface? Right. So, I mean, that's a good question. The thing is, though, that um, so remember that. So, when you say space of Riemann surfaces, yeah. you're already fixing, you know, uh, because this is an infinite type surface, it's not just the topology you're fixing. You sort of have this big. Um, uh, you fixed you fixed the conformal structure. You fixed the Riemann surface structure, and then you're looking at the quasi-conformal deformations of that, right? So, um, so it's not in that type. So that's Teichmuller space, right? When you're looking at you have a fixed conformal structure, a Riemann surface structure on the Loch Ness monster, then you're looking at all the quasi-conformal deformations. That's um, that's the Teichmuller space associated to that Riemann surface. So. There, um, the question is sort of, um, so you, that's just one. Now, if you, I change yeah. the Riemann surface structure, I change the Teichmuller space. Mm -hmm. So you have this big, big space. Right. And um, it's in that context that this question um, is interesting, right? Because now you have this big space where uh, there's complex the Riemann surface structures that are not QC equivalent and then and then the answer is, the full answer, I don't know, but you know that if you're on one of these Teichmuller space, so it's like a, you have these Teichmuller spaces that are all mixed up together, right? In this big, big infinite dimensional, it's an infinite dimensional space. And if you're on one of the Teichmuller spaces, oh, so. then if one of them is QCH, then they're all QCH. Exactly. But, but it's not. Uh, it's probably not true that um, even nearby ones topologically are QCH. Mm -hmm. It's a mess. It's sort of a mess. I mean, it's interesting question, but but it but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of right. Yeah, but the stratification is not nice. That's so. So the the, the dangerous word because I've gone through this thought process too. The when you usually say when you stratify, you sort of have these nice partitions of the space, and there's no natural way to do that. The the levels that we're talking about are sort of all topologically mixed up together because it's infinite dimensional. That's the problem. You're in this infinite dimensional space and. But it's it not nevertheless trying yeah. to figure out. In any anyway, when you have um, let's see, you have one surface which is quasi-conformal to the others, and the first one is too quasi-conformal. By composition, this is multiplying the, the, the case, right? right? Right. So the second one can be not too quasi-conformal. Yes, that's right. So in, in, even in the same Teichmiller space. Oh, oh you may okay, ask right. about this certification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. And and in in there, you could ask for like what the boundary looks like or something or what. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I was thinking of all of the QCH surfaces. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. But you're right. You could look at you could look at how it grows in that particular Teichmiller space. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, mm. right, right. Good, good. <laughs> okay, eh, si hay alguien más preguntas, si no, eh, damos las gracias a Ara. Let's thanks Ara then. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody.